Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, is this okay? We good? Yep. Um, so we have like a minute more, a minute, a minute longer. So I'm gonna take that minute. Um, before I start, there is a uh, talk in the upper room, Digest Shop. It's the talk I intended to go to. So <laughs> if you're interested, this would be a good time to switch. Uh, and if you go there, tell Mark you're representing me also. Um, didn't convince anyone? All right, fuck it. Um, so I, I'm gonna give a talk instead of Leon. Uh, it's called Tip Fucking Toady. It's about best practices. And I didn't have time to submit it properly because I was told about it about 15 minutes ago. So um, uh, the idea is that we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that we do, a lot of technologies that we use, and I wanted to make a list of recommended ones, when, which one to favor over the other. Um, and this is a talk I gave at Cluj PM in Romania a little while ago. Please do come in, do come in, faster, faster, you keep everyone waiting, thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, <clears throat> so, of course we all love Perl, that's why we're here. Um, it's fantastic, it's a great language, we enjoy it, we enjoy the community that we build around it. Um, it's our jobs, it's our, uh, our toys, it's our fun and games and all, all the stuff that we do. And uh, we really, really, really like Tim Toady, which is uh, our slogan of there's more than one way to do it, because with Tim Toady, basically we promote the idea of having multiple solutions to a single problem. And this is really good, because different solutions provide different benefits. <clears throat> and this is, uh, I think Perl is one of the few languages that actually really promotes and is very proud of the idea of having more than one way to solve a problem. We really like that concept, we promote that concept heavily, and it's fantastic, and we, we absolutely love it. But not always. And you probably know what I mean. See, sometimes, <clears throat> when we have too many solutions to a given problem, having so many can lead to anger, frustration, financial damage, and in rare cases, See, the problem with having multiple solutions, other than they're great, is that some of them are wrong. They're absolutely 100% wrong. Some of them are brilliant. They're amazing. They're the exact one that we should use. And the problem is that we need to know which one to pick, right? And choosing them sometimes can be hard. Sometimes it's not they're all equal. Sometimes some of them are dead wrong. You should never, ever fucking do that. But some, sometimes there is one that is exactly right and everything else is wrong. And we need to decide. And this is where the community comes in. In Pearl, we count on conventions generated by the community to know which solutions we should pick. So let's start with some stuff. I'm going to start with CPAN. Finding stuff on CPAN, which is basically just a bunch of mirrors hosting code. Right, it's a comprehensive uh, Pro Archive network. So it's a network of mirrors. And we want to search stuff on those mirrors and install things. To search, we would usually use search cpan.org. Search cpan.org, however, is closed source, which means that we can't really access it. It has very little integration with other services. And it's more of a memory muscle, wherein we're very much accustomed to go into search cpan. It's not even a pretty website. We're just really used to it. On the other hand, we have MetaCPAN. MetaCPAN is open source. It is community-based. It is community-developed. And it has a lot of integration with various utilities and various tools and other uh, services and other websites, like where we host our code, where we develop it versus where we upload it. And it has a lot of really nice tools to help us on our daily work with, um, with our code. For example, it allows us to see reverse dependencies in the website itself. So if we search for a module, we can see, well, how many people actually use this module rather than what modules does it use? And then we can see, oh, a lot of people use it and some really serious things, so I can count on it. And that's a very useful utility. There is a talk later on on the API of, of MetaCPAN it's going to be about uh, MetaCPAN API and MetaCPAN Client. Uh, Mickey is giving that talk over there. 
so you should definitely attend that talk if you want to know more about what we can do with MetaSecant. Inheritance. So uh, when it comes to inheritance, how we build objects and uh, link two classes together. So there's use base. Everyone's used to use base. It is old, unnecessarily complex. On the other hand, we have use parent. Use parent is new. It's good. It's so new, it's actually core since 510. How many people here use parent? How many people here use base over parent? All right, good. So hey, check this out, OK? You can just switch uh, base for parent, and everything will work, and it will be better. If you're using 510 and on, you don't even have to install it, or you can it. Object. The thing with object in Pro, and this is something that is hard to explain to someone until I found the right words for it. The thing with objects in Perl is that, well, Pro 5 specifically, is that um, Pro 5 really takes into account the, the underlying tenets of building a system. So we don't really have objects, but we have everything we need to build a system for objects. And this is the weird part. People say, there's no O. Well, there, there is O. Not exactly. We have what we need to build O. Basically, because Pro always says I should at least give you the tools to build something yourself, if not the exact product itself ready already. So Moose is the best way to write uh, object in Pro. It is fantastic. It used to have speed issues. It doesn't anymore as much, um, and you should definitely use it. <clears throat> However, sometimes we can use Moo. Moo is fantastic for processes that have to start and stop and start and stop often where the, you just have a very short uh, life for the process and you want the loading to be as quick as you can. So you can use Moo. And Moo implements the majority of Moose except the meta layer. So it's two thirds. It's almost always all you need. Then there's Mouse. Mouse was created before Moo was uh, written. And the idea was to make it much faster, which is why it's written in excess. The problem is that there's no interoperability at all between Mouse and Moose. If you have a role written one and a class written in the other, and you want to merge them, all hell breaks loose. Moo, on the other hand, yes, Moo, on the other hand, fakes everything that is required in order for Moose to think it's Moose as well. So they actually cooperate very nicely. So you can write a role in Moo, and everything in Moose can use that too, and it will work seamlessly. It's fantastic. So if you're using mouse, stop it. Before we had that faking of Moo, and we got the breakage of mouse and, and moose, someone wrote any moose. And any moose, the idea was very simple. When the class loads, instead of using moose or using mouse, use any moose. And then it says, if I see moose available in the memory, I'm just going to use moose for your class. If I don't, I'm going to use mouse. And then it's going to be very fast. But then you get, can someone point out the problem with this? Does anyone want to try? Has anyone used any moose? Just a quick question. Am I the only one? Seriously? OK. So we have a, a race condition of loading or, uh, order. So which module was lo loaded sooner? Did you, by happenstance, load a module that used Moose? Because now Moose is in the memory. And now it's going to use Moose. You didn't. Oh, so it loaded Mouse. Now you're using it? it that is still Moose. Now it clashes. It's insane. Don't ever use that. <coughs> and of course, Ingi.net, uh, who is batshit insane, wrote Mo because why not have an object system that does the majority of Mo in a single one? So don't like don't ever use that. It's not don't ever. Like seriously, if you're considering Moose, get the fuck out. Was it Mo supposed to be uh, compatible with Mo? <sighs> supposed to be is a really big term. <laughs> <laughs> Very big term. <clears throat> Enter YAML. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. Alright. Uh, serialization. So uh, what do we use for serialization? Quickly, uh, XML, never. If you ever have a choice, let it never be XML. XML fucking sucks, OK? XML is the Java of uh, serialization formats. Conversely, Java is the XML of programming languages. Um, the problem with XML is that it's written for a very specific purpose, validation. No one does it except banks. No one ever. When's the last time you validated an XML scheme, schema? When was the last time you did this? About a year ago. About a year ago. 
case, usually it's not even then. It's insane. Never, ever, ever fucking use XML. And never program in XML. Well, you, There's JSON. <laughs> JSON is um, uh, web. It's it's really built for the web. It's text based. It's uh, it's really good for configuration. It is your best default. It is a very fast, easy to implement serialization format. Um, it's seamless and it's fantastic. And then you have YAML. YAML is uh, text based. Also, it's very user friendly until you actually get get to a point where you have multiple layers and then spacing matters. Enter Python. Um, however, it's very useful for debugging. So if, for example, you want to debug a session that's going on, you can just print out the session data in YAML. It's very easy to read, even though it's like just serialized data structure. So it's very useful for debugging. It can backfire when you want to use it for user friendly, for, for user uh, friendly, user facing um, Interfaces uh, when it becomes too bloated and too big for YAML, and of course, if you're using binary, if you're working binary, you should definitely uh, know Storable. Storable is our basic binary format. Um, it is incompatible with uh, Pro versions, with Storable versions, with uh, 64, 32 bit, uh, with itself, with the moon. <laughs> it's it, I can't. It's horrible. The res, however, serial. Serial was written by Booking. It is uh, insanely, insanely, insanely optimized and fast. It is compatible with different versions, different bits. It's fantastic. Um, there's some uh, really good benchmarks that you should check out. And uh, it really is a, an example of how to write awesome shit in Pro. <coughs> and it is so awesome that it's being uh, com um, moved to other languages. It's being ported. There is implementation in Go, and I think other languages are working on it too because it is a really, really good series of format. Moving on to user agents. Um, so user agents, if uh, anyone is familiar with that, basically allows you to uh, have a browser without an actual browser. So you can make all the requests, you can understand all of it, and then you can uh, work with that, and you can scan websites and do whatever you want. So uh, our basic one is the WP user agent, right? Uh, who knows the WP user agent? You can raise your hands. Fantastic. Uh, so it's fantastic. It, <coughs> it's old. It is very predictable, it is very stable, it's very useful, it's, it's really, really, really good, and you should go ahead and keep using it. I should add Mechanize. mechanize is a, a, a lot of, it's like a nice wrapper around user agent, uh, LWP user agent, and it gives you all of the niceties of actually having a browser, like move forward, move back, uh, it understands links, images, has objects for each one. It's, it's really, really nice. You can just submit the third form with this user data. Really nice, and you don't have to do a post on it, just does all of that. So it's very good. There's it should be tiny. It should tiny has much less overhead, it's tiny. and um, it has fewer features, but it is mostly suitable for uh, the tasks that we have. So, or I should say, it is suitable, suitable for most tasks that we have. So, if you're scraping websites, definitely use www.mechanize. Uh, if you're making HTTP requests, usually you should try HTTP tiny. Anywhere in between for other user agent doesn't exist that much. But if you're using it, it's not that bad. <laughs> templates, because, oh my god, templates. Uh, who here has written their own template engine? Stop it. Who <laughs> 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 here has written and then deprecated it? Okay. So, um, so, right. So, um, that's, uh, that's our templates. Let's start. HTML template. No! 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 It sucks. Don't use it. Ever. Can I get an amen? Okay. Approved. Approved. Whatever. Right. So, HTML template sucks for a lot of reasons. It's fast, but it really, really, really sucks. There's a lot of things with it that are really fucking shitty. Don't use it. Uh, Mason. Hell no! Mason is even worse. <laughs> Mason conflates every possible thing in web programming into the same fucking template system. It, it is PHP but on acid, which is not better. It's just it's it's really bad but it's much faster. It gets from zero to sucks way quicker. Um, Mason basically says I'm going to put the controller, the dispatcher, the model, the view. I'm going to put everything into the view, and it sucks. It really sucks. So don't ever use Mason. Mason 2 was an attempt to fix it, but no one actually uses it. Because people who use Mason usually are just stuck with it. That's why they use Mason. So they don't move to Mason 2. 
And it's not that big of a change, uh, in my opinion. Their Semi Toolkit, it's a fantastic uh, template system. It is really fast, it is uh, comfortable, it is very um, useful for uh, users. Um, it's just simple to use uh, if you're giving it to a designer, um, HTML person, whatever, they can do it really easily. If you want to go nuts, you can use Xlight. It is written in excess, it is in fucking insane. Um, it is, however, batshit crazy. If you want to spend the time to learn it, go ahead, it's fantastic. <laughs> Web, which is where passion goes to die. Um, web programming, there's so much to say about web programming. So, so much. And I am giving a talk later about um, in our status with it. The thing with web programming, really, there is only one thing I want to say. Are you still using CGI? Don't answer. I don't want to know. <laughs> if you are still using CGI, this is the only thing I want to say. <laughs> you should use PSDI. You really, 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 really should use PSDI instead of CGI. There's a multitude of reasons, and I explained that very well in different talks. And you can talk to me afterwards about this. And seriously, this really is the only thing I want to say about web right now. Just use PSGI. And people sometimes say, really? Like, seriously? Seriously? I can't use CGI? Seriously? And they're like, seriously? Don't. And of course, for the last two minutes, I'm going to talk about thread signals, CPU, parallel execution. However, we don't have the time for it. So we are going to do it next time. Okay? Thank you. I'm done. Questions? Um, there is a, a moment for one question. I think you're giving a talk like right now, aren't you? No, no we're still five minutes. There's still five minutes? Well, uh, yeah, five, minutes. Three, three. five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Oh. That guy. I, I was most on your numbers uh, last slide. Was it PSGI? I'm used to it. I was on the You what? I'm sorry. What is PSGI? What is PSGI? So uh, PSGI is doing the web correctly. Basically, it's a different protocol that allows you to separate your application logic from your server um, and in a really nice way, and then allows some nice features like mounting different applications, different paths, um, uh, multi-levels of dispatching, uh, middleware to wrap your code in it. Uh, Ruby has RAC, and um, uh, Python has WSGI. We have PSGI. It's really fantastic. There's an entire protocol on this, and there's time implementation for this, and most of the web frameworks, including actually Mason 2, support PSGI. So if you're looking at Dancer, Modulicious, Catalyst, um, Amon2, and so on, they all support PSGI, they're PSGI based. Which means that you can put them on any web server, wrap them in whatever code you want, and it just works. It's fantastic. It's amazing. Yes? Uh, how, how do we tackle all those legacy hosting providers and so on? I mean, they need to move on and all that, that we can get. For what? Any anything? of the things I said, or just PSGI or just CGI? No, or base out CGI so that PSGI just runs on all those shared hosting providers. Right? Well, you can run CGI on PSGI, you can run PSGI on CGI. No, I won't mean like so that means that you can take parts of your code and slowly transform it. Honestly, you should embrace that, that migration path, that's what I'm trying to say. What is the migration path? It really depends on what situation you're in. Yeah. It would take me longer to cover. I'm not asking for it, I'm basically <laughs> conceptual version how to get there. Conceptual version, uh, everything that is deprecated or that you don't have to continue developing, you keep it at a, on a compatibility layer underneath PSGI and new developments are done in PSGI. And anything that is a hot path, uh, very important, you can rewrite it in PSGI. That, is, that would be my approach. I think that's the most practical. approach now, that's where I'm trying to get at. Perhaps. That sounds like a talk. <laughs> May I... Um, uh, Matt, you need to give a talk at the next uh, pro workshop. <laughs> Actually, I've been trying to do that, but I want, I can get it done with a complex uh, application. Well, a complex application is not very good application. Well, complex applications require complex solutions. Um, and I don't know if in a minute I'll have a complex answer. <laughs> is, that, is that better? So you might consider refactoring it. Yeah. Refactoring requires uh, profit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
And last one. How many years will it take before you have to start PSTI to die? How many? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, remains to be seen. <laughs> remains to be seen. But I'll run that by you as soon as I write it. <laughs> right? Thank you.